August 21, 1983, a day forever etched in the memory of Filipinos. figure in Safari White, the name, Benigno Aquino Jr., Ninoy for short, his age 50, clutched in his right hand a broken rosary. His mission, reconcile the Filipino people and restore democracy. His assassin or assassins, still legally unknown, the government in power at the time, the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. Earlier on, Mr. Marcos had proclaimed martial law then locked him up seven years and seven months in Fort Bonifacio. The name on Ninoy's passport, Marcial Bonifacio. <laughs> Ninoy, no name in Philippine history has ever held the nation in such a grip except that of Jose Rizal. There was another riveting similarity. The fusillade that brought Rizal down at the Luneta triggered the Philippine revolution against Spain. The bullet that snuffed out Ninoy's life spawned the bloodless Edsa revolution on February 22 to 25, 1986. Each man dying almost a century apart brought out the best in the Filipino. Each had the same attributes, a superbly gifted mind, a bottomless passion for liberty, but most of all, courage. Courage to look the enemy in the eye. Courage to brave every battlefield. Courage to die for one's convictions. But while Rizal's life had been minutely and thoroughly researched by historians, what was Ninoy really like? Who was he? What made him tick? Behind the boyish, beatific smile the assassin's bullet could not efface. What forces drove Ninoy? Everybody marveled at his courage, his heart. Where did he get it? What spiritual wells nourished his soul? What was his magic? Why did two million mourners attend his funeral? the biggest such turnout in contemporary history. Tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands poured out into the streets in post-funeral rallies and demonstrations. Almost everything he touched was instant drama. Why? There are many answers like Cross Karen's in a raging river. For Ninoy was not a simple person. But the first solid clue to his extraordinary courage, his burning desire to excel in everything he did, was the death of his father, Don Benigno Aquino, on December 20, 1947. The young Ninoy idolized his father, eyes twinkling with pride at every step as he carried his papa's portfolio as a boy. After the Second World War, the Japanese occupation. They accused Don Benigno of being a collaborator, a traitor. The charges seared like hot iron. Nino himself was taunted in the streets, in public plazas, in school. What really hurt was when an Ateneo High School teacher branded him the son of a traitor. The young Nino held his tears, but he swore. Silently, he swore his day would come. Then he would show the world what an Aquino really was. Courage is not for the asking, Nino once said. The heart lifts and the body throbs only when somebody else has the courage to die for his principles and convictions. Death was still far away when Nino did two things not long after his father's death but they were to chart his destiny. Ninoy became a journalist and covered the Korean War, age 17 to 18. Then he married 
Pori Kohwanko, age 21. Journalism for Ninoy was like nectar from the gods of fate. As a reporter for the Manila Times, he learned how to write, how to capture the essence of life in print. As he later did in jail, that was another similarity between him and Rizal. Both were prodigious letter writers, each paragraph an exciting pulse beat in the historic drama, each played out to the very end. Coverage of the war in Korea brought the teenage Ninoy to the charnel house of what was outrageous in civilization. War. War among nations. Death was an everyday occurrence as Ninoy covered the exploits of the 10th BCT as guns spat, artillery war, bombs exploded, Ninoy saw comrades disembodied, limbs fly away, heads blown off. He was too young to be transfixed with horror, but the smell, the sight and the experience of death would stand Ninoy well in the years ahead. Marriage to Cory Kohuanko was a godsend. Highly educated herself, Cory had the intellect, patience and understanding Ninoy needed. Cory and the five children were his haven his sanctuary from countless battles he fought outside. And it came as no surprise that when the thunder broke into a tempest after Ninoy's death, Cory picked up Ninoy's torch and strode forth to battle. There was just one more step to take after the marriage to Cory. Enter politics. There was this burning desire in Ninoy to compensate Compensate for what they did to his father, a politician himself. Compensate for every insult, every taunt to the Aquino name when the issue of Japanese collaboration was raised after the Second World War. Ninoy was also out to prove that public service was a public trust, that the name Benigno Aquino would be synonymous with achievement, with sterling public performance and integrity. In politics, Ninoy would dazzle everybody. He was primus inter pares, first among equals. Here was Ninoy going faster, higher, stronger than everybody else on his level. Youngest mayor at 23, youngest provincial vice governor at 27, youngest provincial governor at 28, youngest senator of the REM at 35. Only the presidency remained. Looming over Ninoy was the formidable figure of President Ferdinand Marcos. Marcos was the politician par excellence. Marcos was cunning, astute, clever. Power, political power, was Marcos's forte, and he wielded it with the virtuosic skill of a master magician and a Tartar overlord. Fifteen years older than Ninoy, Marcos spotted his political quarry early on when Ninoy was the political kingpin of Tarlac. As fate would have it, Tarlac became the first dueling ground between the two. What was it about Tarlac? Tarlac was hook or communist territory. Tarlac was where Luis Taruk, commanders Ali Bas Bas and Sumulo cast their spell on a large slice of the peasantry. Ninoy needed provincial peace, and to get it, he struck some sort of a truce with the Huk leadership. There was something about Ninoy in Tarlac that caught the eye of Marcos. Ninoy fascinated him. Ninoy was a young political cougar who moved with almost effortless ease in the jungle of politics. In that jungle, Marcos was king, but he probably saw Ninoy as a terrific comer. At this early stage, Ninoy had to be won over, bought, or stopped. And thus began the political duel that would eventually convulse the Philippines, lead to martial law and Ninoy's arrest and pave the way for the eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation between the man in the palace and the man in prison. In the first stages, Ninoy loved it. 
From a relative unknown nationally, he strode into the limelight as Marcos branded him a communist, if not a card-carrying communist, a communist cuddler. As Ninoy himself said much later on, he had never been a communist, was not a communist, and never would be. But he relished those communist lightning bolts from Marcos. Why not? Here was the president, the great one, taking notice of him. And when the massacre at Plaza Miranda occurred on August 21, 1971, the minions of Marcos snidely suggested that Ninoy and the communists could have been behind it. For Marcos, it was uncanny. Instead of weakening Ninoy with charges that he was a communist, Ninoy's star continued to soar. Ninoy added insult to injury when he was the lone LP senatorial candidate to win the 1967 senatorial elections. The awards came, the honors. Ninoy's was a virtuoso performance for a political Benjamin such as the Philippines had never seen. For four consecutive years, 1968 to 1971, he was voted outstanding senator by the Senate Press Club. For three consecutive years, he was voted outstanding senator by the Philippines Free Press. In 1971, he was chosen Man of the Year by the Philippines Free Press. Ninoy reaped headlines with the greatest of ease, often at Marcos's and Imelda's expense. The young senator drew blood with the Jabida Exposé brought down the house with revelations that Marcos owned a cluster of luxurious mansions, had emailed the hopping man with his witty sallies on the cultural center, got back to Marcos by claiming the president had itchy, vagabond fingers that juggled items in the national budget. Obviously, Ninoy had his eye set on the presidency as the leading aspirant of the Liberal Party. Not very obviously, Marcos set about to foil Ninoy's bid by preparing secretly to declare martial law. Since the Constitution forbade him from running for a third term, Marcos must have realized he could feel nobody, not even his glamorous wife Imelda, to square off successfully against Ninoy. If the 1973 presidential elections were held, nobody doubted Ninoy would win. And so, on September 21, 1972, Marcos proclaimed martial law, and another battle was joined between Marcos and Ninoy. To all intents and purposes, Ninoy looked like the loser, Marcos, the winner. As the political wings of Marcos and his generals spread eagle the country, Ninoy was shunted into a four by five meter prison cell in the grim fortress that was Fort Bonifacio. The fates then appeared to have willed that Ninoy be consigned to the Book of Job the triumphant Marcos to the book of Jupiter. The greatest punishment fate could inflict on Ninoy was to subject him to solitary confinement in this tiny prison cell. Outside, the whole wide world was Ninoy's stage, for Ninoy was larger than life. And his every move, every word, his every gesture held everyone in thrall. I have been in solitary for five and a half years, and you don't know, Mr. Nabal, what is to be alone 24 hours a day. It is not true what Secretary Enrile said that I am free to roam around here. That's not true. I am brought out one hour a day to exercise, and I am brought back to my room and I'm locked up. For the last five and a half years, I've been locked up alone in my room. Alone in his cramped cell. Unable in seven years and seven months to see the moon and the stars. Ninoy gradually realized he was in for keeps. His close prison mates were gradually released 
Monchín Mitra, Gino Roses, Soc Rodrigo, Teodoro Loxin, Max Oliven, Pepe Diogno, Nabrama, and myself. Only Pepe Diogno remained to eventually share with Ninoy the terrible torment of La Un. But Diogno too was subsequently freed after two years in Fort Bonifacio. What has uh, imprisonment taught me? Well, I think it has tested the limits of my capacity, which is, uh, to me, a, uh, a tremendous uh, benefit. Before being in prison, I did not know the limits of my capacity. I either overestimated myself or underestimated myself in many instances. I think after seven years, now I have a better measure of myself. I know the, the limits of my patience, the limits of my tolerance, the limits of my endurance, the limits of my intelligence, of my comprehension, of my analysis. This is the thing that has given me here. That's why uh, so there's really, really no sense in getting sore. I can look at, uh, at problems more objectively. I, I could be free when I saw Marcos, I said, brother, ano? Yeah, I'll release you tomorrow. Hi, Mr. President, I want to tell you that uh, if you're doing good and the people say you're okay, mananahimik na ako. Uh, pero kung sabi ng tayo masama ang ginagawa mo, talaga namang masama, eh, mag-aaway din tayo at babalik mo rin ka ako sa Bonifacio. So unless you're ready to leave martial law, ay eh, ako okay na lang sa akin. Nung araw, gustong gusto kong talagang kuhan, makalabas. At uh, I want to be with my children, my family, pero... Ina isip isip ko, hindi na rin kakot maganda na rin itong katayuan na ito. Ayoko naman masabi na dumating ang panahon na nagkasubukan, eh nalalaki tayo. Masabi naman at least na meron pa namang tumayo at naghirap. And so the prison vice grew tighter and tighter. The man in the palace presumably felt power would eventually break the man in prison. Ninoy was made to understand that all he needed to be free was to do one thing, scribble a message to Marcos that he was ready for a deal. A deal to cooperate with, to serve if he wished, under the Marcos dictatorship. Ninoy refused, and thus, Daul. Up on the hills in Fort Magsaysay, Nova Ecija, an even tinier cell awaited Ninoy. Laul was psychological torture of the worst kind. Not a hand was laid on him in physical punishment. No pistol was thrust against his temple. No electrode was strapped on his nipples or testicles to make him scream for mercy. Laul was something else. Laul was complete isolation from the world. Not even Cory or any member of the family, nor Senators Lorenzo Taniada or Jovito Salonga, Ninoy's top two lawyers, knew of Laul. For that matter, neither Ninoy nor Pepe Diogno knew they were in Laul except afterwards. In Laul, they stripped Ninoy of his eyeglasses, his watch his wedding ring, his belt, his comb, his shoes. Each day, he had to ask for water, toothpaste, toothbrush, permission to go to the toilet from his guards. Laul was the agony of a man in the darkness, not knowing whether the morrow would mean death before a firing squad. Laul was a perpetual blindfold on what the next moment would bring. Laul was the fear that every putrid meal was poisoned. Laul was Ninoy subsisting on soda crackers or biscuits. Laul was where Ninoy cursed the Filipino people, the leaders of the country, and even God. Laul was where Ninoy had no pencil pen or paper, where he could write his thoughts that spread like jungle fever in his tortured mind. He was later to write all these in a post Laur diary. What terrible crimes have I committed to deserve this fate?
the magnanakaos are living it up, and I, who tried to walk the narrow path of public service with integrity, am now about to meet an uncertain fate. Is this justice? But when I was placed in deep solitary confinement, nobody to talk to, I became desperate. And here I started to question the fundamentals of my belief. Firstly, is there really a God? Laul was where Ninoy himself said he cried like a baby, where he was sitting in a corner on the floor telling himself, now I'm going to die without talking to Cory. I won't see my children anymore. Laul was Ninoy losing so much weight, he had to hold up his beltless pants lest they slip to the ground. And yes, Laur was where Ninoy fought with all his might against going insane. They brought me to a mountain hideout in the Sierra Madre and placed me in a box. I had only my brief and my t-shirt. I refused to eat because I thought they were poisoning me. There was nothing in the room, barely nothing. And I had nothing to do but twiddle my thumb. And for the first time in my life, I heard the ticking of every second and I was counting every second into minutes. And as the minutes marched into hours and the hours into days and days into weeks, I knew what loneliness meant. In a later letter, Nino wrote that to fight off the shadows of madness, he would walk daily around his cot barefoot. And he would go back in memory as far as he could, back to his childhood days and the remembrances would come in little ripples. And finally, the remembrances rolled into a big wave over to the present on Ninoy alone, forsaken and forgotten in Laul. Ninoy came close to the point of breaking, but he did not break. When I was brought to Laur, where I had my real great uh, spiritual crisis in Laur, I started from the beginning, and I disowned God. Eh, ba't ikang ganun kung mayroong Diyos eh, bakit ito mga walang kasalan naghihirap? Yan namang mapagsamantalaan silang gumiginhawa. The terror that was Laur finally met its match on the 14th day. He was then squatting on the floor when he saw or thought he saw the image of the Virgin Mother on the blank wall. He was later to tell a journalist in Boston, Arnold Zetlin, I don't know whether the Virgin Mary was trying to tell me, now look, you're just going through the faces of my son Jesus. First, you were joyful, you were born, you became a senator, you had pomp and glory. Why are you complaining? You already had pomp and glory. Now it's the sorrowful. Who knows if you survive this sorrowful thing? There's the glory again. Just go on with it. And so Ninoy returned to the rosary. For nine days he said the rosary almost all day long, and he prayed as he had never prayed before. Dear Lord, I just want to see my wife and children for 30 minutes. After that, I can die. On the ninth day, Corey and the five Aquino children came, and the captain of the guard said, Sir, you have 30 minutes. By some freak accident of fate, the young lieutenant in charge of Laul was Voltaire Gazmin. Now Colonel Voltaire Gazmin, head of President Corazon Aquino's elite presidential security group. Ninoy was his godfather in marriage. The ninth day was April 8, 1973, 43 days after Cory saw Ninoy last in Fort Bonifacio. Cory related to Ninoy how Senator Camiada wept publicly for the first time in his appearance before the Supreme Court. 
This was after Ninoy and Pepe Diokno disappeared from Fort Bonifacio. Tanyaga begged to know where Ninoy and Pepe were. Were they still alive? Was Ninoy already dead? If he was still alive somewhere, could Cory and the children visit him? The April 8 rendezvous in Laur was a page torn from Gulag Archipelago. Ninoy could not contain his tears. He later wrote in his diary, I felt ashamed that Cory was the stronger one. And she kept telling me, you can do it. Cory recalls that Ninoy looked awful. His hair disheveled, his pants baggy, his t-shirt grimy. Ninoy told Cory that he felt death was just around the corner. He gave Cory instructions that almost amounted to his last will and destiny, what to do with their properties. It was a strange and eerie spectacle. Two rolls of chicken coop stood between Ninoy and Cory and the kids. Behind Ninoy was an army photographer also clicking away. Cory gritted her teeth and firmed up her resolve. Hindi kami patatalo. Bolsi Aquino, the eldest child, told Ninoy, Dad, our luck will change. So did Noinoy, so did Viel and Pinky. It was a family cheering squad, dauntless and unafraid, telling Ninoy not to lose hope that despite all the sad things befalling the family, there was hope. Chris, then only two years old, would recall she saw her dad like an animal in a cage. The key word was hope. And with hope, also faith and prayer. As military cameras continued to click away, as military personnel close by glared at the proceedings, Ninoy and Cory agreed that no matter how often they prayed the rosary, Every evening at 8, they would clutch the rosary beads in communion with each other. But Ninoy had no watch. How was he to know it was 8 p.m.? This did not present a problem. All day in Laul, he was praying the rosary. At 8 p.m., he was sure to be praying the rosary. I now agree that man's Reason has a limit. That's why he's man. That's why he's finite. And if he's man, then how can he comprehend which is not man, which is infinite? So that if you are finite and limited, you cannot possibly encompass what is unlimited. Man will have to go as far as reason will bring him, but at that point, at that abyss, you take a leap in the dark. In a, it's a matter of faith. In other words, where reason ends, faith begins. In prayer and in faith, Ninoy's tremendous vitality and energy turned inward in Laur. Where before he was a whirling political dervish with the world as his stage, in Laur the turning inward swept Ninoy into another world. The world of the spirit, the world of God. Laur was meant to break Ninoy, bring him to his knees, bring him with head bowed to the portals of Malacanang. The opposite happened. But in the depths of my desolation, I discovered my faith and my God. And it was only then that I realized I'm nothing. I realized that all the pomp, the glory of the Senate were ephemeral. That wealth, that clothing, keeping up with the Joneses was not of this world really. And having discovered that, I have lost my appetite for power. After Laur, Ninoy no longer relished political power as the end game of his life. The man in the palace would still shoot his last bolt with the forthcoming court trial of Ninoy. But by this time, the man in prison had crossed his Rubicon. Nothing terrestrial held any terror for him anymore. 
For seven years, I was not allowed to see the moon and the stars. There were days where they left me all alone by myself. I had no reading material. I had nothing. I was twiddling my thumb. I would walk and walk and walk across my room. Just a room of about four meters by five meters. Hoping that I'll get tired. And then when I get tired, I will fall asleep. Knowing that tomorrow will be the same. And I often ask myself, Eh, bakit ka pa nagpapakahirap dito? In 73, a high official of the government asked me, Endorse mo na lamang ang new society ni Noy. Ayos na. Ilalabas na kita. When I refused, they advised me, sumulat ka na lang kay Marcos. Ask for his forgiveness. O yun na naman ka akong kasalanan. Kung ay siya nagkasala sa bayan, bakit akong hihingi ng tawad? My friends, I cannot understand the temerity and the gall of these people. Eh, kang ganun, be practical. Eh, talagang ganun eh. Makibagay ka na, ikaw, napakalakas ka ng bagyo eh. Ikaw lahi ka mahihirapan diyan. Mag-isa ka dyan. Hindi balik kang ganun. Kung ayaw mo nang sumulat, eh, tumawag ka na lang sa telepono, ibulong mo na lamang. Ayos na. I would like to tell you, that I was tempted in my 7,000, almost 7,285 days in prison to do just that. I am only human. Ako po isang tao lamang. When my wife and children would visit me and they would leave me at task after one hour, I also would like to enjoy the embrace of my children and the peace of my home. But if I gave faith in that conviction, if I refused to accept the jurisdiction of a military court, and because I refuse to defend myself, they will give me the death sentence. I vowed to myself that because you have elected me to the Senate and I gloried in its pomp, therefore it is now time that, that's my, I am, uh, that I must suffer the consequences of my act. And because I knew, I knew early on, and I discovered that there is a God who is just na merong isang Panginoon na ibibigay sa atin ang ating ka kagandahang ginawa at paparusahin tayo sa ating kamaliang nagawa rin. It is because of that faith in my divine creator that sustained me all these years. Four months after Laul, the martial law government, the Ferdinand Marcos, filed formal charges of subversion, murder, and illegal possession of firearms against Ninoy. If Ninoy could not be broken in Laur and had to be brought back to Fort Bonifacio, then the trial and the eventual sentence of death would finish him off. The trial was what Ninoy and his legal counsel predicted it would be. A kangaroo court, a mockery of justice, a travesty of due process, where Ninoy was depicted as a killer communist. Many witnesses was, were paraded before me. I never saw them in my life. And yet they were pointing fingers at me, accusing me of crimes I never committed. They admitted to crimes. They said they were communists. They said they were number three in the communist hierarchy. And yet the government set them free, and I was in jail. Ninoy was no more a communist than Ferdinand Marcos was. But communism was a dirty word, a swear word. Like Goebbels, the government repeated the charge of communism against Ninoy until it grew like a genie billowing out of the bottle. Lies repeated a million times became truth, according to Goebbels. But I knew that somehow I will regain my freedom, maybe not in this world, but elsewhere. And I knew that sometime, somewhere, Mr. Marcos and I will meet. And in that meeting, I will have my satisfaction. In his opening statement before military commission number two, 
Ninoy announced he would boycott the trial. He said, My act of non-participation is therefore an act of protest against the structures of injustice that brought us here. It is also an act of faith in the ultimate victory of right over wrong, of good over evil. In all humility, I say it is a rare privilege to share with motherland her bondage, her anguish, her every pain and suffering. And as the barrel-chested General Jose Sihuko and his commission members glowered at the defendant, Ninoy said, Sirs, I know you to be honorable men, but the one undesirable fact is that you are subordinates of the president. You may decide to preserve my life, but he can choose to send me to death. Some people suggest that I beg for mercy, but this I cannot in conscience do. I would rather die on my feet in honor than live on bended knees in shame. It was during the trial that Ninoy staged a hunger strike. Nobody could stop Ninoy. It was Ninoy's way of protesting the unfairness of it all. Ninoy was told that hunger strikes could only attract attention if the press was free, if there was no dictatorship, if the weakening throb of his heart and the ravages wrought on his once robust body could be communicated to the world outside. Mahatma Gandhi's fast succeeded in arousing India and the world. The world press was right there at his bedside. For Ninoy, there was no press, or hardly any. What existed was the Ninoy of Laur, a shaft of spiritual steel, determined to look at death in the eye. In his April 6, 1975 letter to Soc Rodrigo, Ninoy wrote, I have decided to challenge death. I do not believe I am sinning against my creator because in the end, I'm not really my own executioner. By my example, I hope I can inspire others, like the dominoes want us to fall to create the chain reaction. Unfortunately, it is my sad fate to depart before the deluge. And to Corey, his mother, and his family, he wrote on April 14, 1975, there comes a time in a man's life when he must prefer a meaningful death to a meaningless life. Let Mr. Marcos realize there are still Filipinos who are prepared to suffer and lay down their lives for a cause bigger than their own physical survival. During Ninoy's hunger strike, Cory filled the role of Pieta. She had to be fearless as Ninoy was fearless, persevering as Ninoy was persevering, resolute as Ninoy was resolute. No tears rolled from her eyes as she nursed Ninoy day after day until his weight fell from 160 to 123 pounds. Getting Ninoy to the bathroom was an ordeal. Corey placed three folding chairs between bed and bathroom like weigh stations. At each folding chair, Ninoy would sit down to rest crank up enough strength from his already frail and faltering body. Then, he would lean on Cory again, go through the same process. Like two desert stragglers holding on to each other for dear life, lest separately they fall and be devoured by the swirling sands. At night, Cory would wake up to check if Ninoy was still alive. The situation was already hellish as it was, but the tormentors of Ninoy had something more up their sleeve. They would barbecue chicken or pork near his cell. The aroma wafted into his room, but Ninoy could no longer be broken. The body had shrunk to a pitiful shell, but the heart was there, big as ever cast into a spiritual iron by Laur, and Ninoy's soul was absolutely immune to the smell of chicken and pork barbecue. On the 30th day, 
Jaime Cardinal Singh came to administer the final rites. On the 32nd day, the military rushed Ninoy to the Veterans Memorial Hospital. At the hospital, they force fed him with dextrose as his blood pressure dangerously dipped to 60 over 40. On the 40th day, realizing that he had been force fed, Ninoy broke his fast. The question is, uh, I am in good physical health and when I went to hunger strike, what made me cause to stop after 40 days? Was it because I was afraid to die? I would like to be very candid this afternoon. I went on a hunger strike as a protest to what they did to me in the military commission. But more than a symbolic protest, I must admit I had a death wish. I wanted to die. And so I went on until I lost about 40 pounds. From 163, I dropped to about 127. And then I was rushed to the hospital. My mother cried, and my wife naturally, and my children, but I was determined. I felt that uh, I've served a full life, and it was time to go. But somehow on the 40th day, I was struck by that letter of Father de la Costa to me. And he said, do you think by trying to die you are being courageous? He said, you're not being courageous, you're a coward. It is more courageous to go on living. You're opting out, you're escaping. And it's an act of cowardice. To continue living and to continue fighting. He said, it's more courageous. And ultimately he said, if you believe in the divine will, do not interfere with his will. Let his will be done. Ninoy by then had received information that Malacanang would stop his fast at the point when he was already a vegetable to keep him alive. To renew the fast would have been very dangerous. After seven years, I've lost my dogmatism. Nung araw ay, I was so sure, you know, of things. But after seven years, you know, of contemplation, uh, there is really nothing sure in this world except death. Eh? <laughs> after Laur, after the hunger strike, Death and Ninoy had looked each other squarely in the face. Neither blinked. On the contrary, they parted like comrades in arms and agreed to another rendezvous, this time for always. session and upon secret written ballot five of the members present at the time the vote was taken concurring sentences each one of you to suffer the penalty of death by firing squad November 25, 1977, the military commission sentenced Ninoy to death by musketry. Marcos must have finally decided death was the most convenient way to settle the simmering years-long duel with Ninoy. Why not? By this time, who cared for Ninoy anyway? Many of his friends and followers had deserted him. At the rare parties to which the Aquinos were still invited, Cory and her in-laws found themselves alone at the table. The men and the women who prior to martial law had high praises for Ninoy had long joined the queue to Malacanang. Crestfallen, 
Cory and the rest of the Aquinos visited Ninoy at Fort Bonifacio after the death verdict. To their surprise, Ninoy was in high spirits. He assured them that Marcos would not make a martyr out of him, not yet. If he was going to die at the hands of his enemies, Ninoy said, it would be done in another way. True enough, Marcos suspended the execution and called for a reinvestigation of the case. In the Philippines, there was little reaction, but abroad, particularly in the U.S. and the West, the outrage against Ninoy's death sentence poured out like angry lava. Ninoy had become an excruciating dilemma for the dictatorship. Alive, Ninoy was still a problem. Dead, Ninoy would also pose a problem. All right then, let Ninoy rot here in Fort Bonifacio. The stay of Ninoy's execution by firing squad was to be perceived as an act of presidential magnanimity. What mattered was power, and the Marcoses were then firmly and solidly in power. Across two oceans, the U.S. government generously gave its blessings to the Marcos dictatorship. Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan successfully backed him up. So Ninoy again lapsed into oblivion. But not long afterwards, fate quickened. The 1978 Batasan Pambansa elections, against an earlier decision of the political opposition to boycott, Ninoy decided to participate. Thus was born Laban, a ragtag group of 21 opposition candidates with nothing but patriotism in their minds, audacity in their hearts, and fire in their bellies. Thus was born the Laban sign of extended forefinger and thumb. It looked like a ludicrous, futile effort with Ninoy campaigning from jail. In the beginning, very few attended Laban rallies. The people were still scared stiff. But something happened. Marcos instructed then Defense Minister Juan Ponce Enrile to smite Ninoy on nationwide TV as a CIA agent. The charge was shocking, considering that Ninoy had earlier been convicted as a communist subversive. Ninoy asked for equal opportunity for rebuttal also on TV. Surprisingly, Marcos granted the request. If you will recall, Secretary Enrile was the one who linked me to the CIA. But how can Secretary link me when he already has in his possession a letter saying that I've never been with the CIA? Now, that is the contradiction in his part, not on my part. He claimed that there were monitored conversations here while in my room I was talking to a colonel and I claimed. Now, these were bug conversations. On the basis of that, he now went to the press and says, Aquino claimed he's a CIA agent. But if he already has a document saying that I have never been a CIA agent by the CIA himself, why did he ever bring it out? To embarrass me, to say that I'm a liar? In other words, I will no longer go into the hassle of all of this CIA business. I stand by the record of that CIA clearing me that I have never been a CIA agent or never been trained by them, so let it be. Ninoy on TV was a revelation. Traffic in almost all of Metro Manila came to a dead stop as the citizenry stormed their TV sets to watch Ninoy. You are a candidate of the Lakas ng Bayan. Yes. And uh, according to Senator, uh, former Senator Rojas, uh, you're not supposed to run and uh, they might, uh, well, not impeach you, but uh, take you out of the party. I am very glad that you finally brought the needed commercial because I was afraid, you know, I will miss this chance. Oh, you got one hour and 30 minutes. No, uh, <laughs> I would like to say that I was the one who originally proposed the national boycott in fairness to, Secretary Ro uh, to Senator Rojas and, and Salonga. That Friday morning at the Batas and Bayan when they were meeting and Governor San Luis of Laguna proposed black voting, I was so stunned that when Jovi visited me at noon, I said, Jovi, please issue a joint statement in our name asking and urging our people for a national boycott because this is just too much. The government already has all the forces in its command. They have the entire machinery of politics which we do not have. And ngayong kako, bulok voting pa. 
Abi mamamatay naman kako tayo dyan. Eh, yung bulok boting na yun, isinuka na ng, ng matandang lipunan. Eh, palala mo naman sa atin ng bagong lipunan. Eh, huwag naman kakong ganon. So, this was the situation. Jovi took my word for it, and he reported to Jerry about my reaction, and they issued subsequently the press statement. Later on, I had to rethink. Eh, paano naman kako kung pwede makipag-usap sa bayan kung hindi na ako kakandidato rito? Eh, ako yun naman talagang kating-kating ang makipag-usap sa bayan. The intellect was there, bright, nimble, luminous. The wit was there, subtle, rollicking, and pungent. Why do you refuse to present evidence in the court? Ah, beautiful. You know, Mr. Marcos is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the Philippines. All of these generals are military officers. Mr. Marcos said I'm guilty by overwhelming evidence. He ordered me to jail for five years. If these officers will say I am innocent, it's just like saying Mr. Marcos is a liar. And they will never do that. All I ask Mr. Marcos is, send me before an impartial tribunal. Not a military officer. But uh, you're prejudging all these uh, military officers. But napaso na ako eh. If you attend that uh, Dogon mission, we stand up, hindi ka pa nakakatayo eh. Denied ang motion mo eh. Eh, siyempre mga general yan eh. Eh, pag eh, nagalit si Apo sa kanila, eh, diretirado na sila. But uh, sir, would you, wouldn't you think that uh, by making a statement such as that, you really questioning the integrity of all these men? No, it is the circumstance, Ronnie. Kamukha mo, impiyado ka ng NMPC, maatakin pa si Marcos? Ba hindi pwede? No, no. Ay, na nga. And most of all, the heart was there. As a result, the Laban rally started to pick up like swollen water breaking the dikes. The ever-bulging Laban crowd swarmed into the April 6 noise barrage. It was a sight to see, a sound to hear that noise barrage. It was one huge electrifying din of church bells ringing, kettles pounding, cars honking, pans tossing, and empty gasoline cans rattling. Tens of thousands wasted all over the city, shouting the name of Ninoy, flashing the Laban sign. The jubilation was short-lived. On election day, April 7, Marcos pulled out all the stops. The communists, he said, orchestrated the noise barrage. The nation had to be saved, and so it was Marcos fashion. Not one Laban candidate made it in the counting, despite several surveys that showed Ninoy as a top-notcher. Marcos pulled out the most potent weapon from his political arsenal, fear. Fear and the communist bogey. Fear of arrest, fear of harassment, intimidation, persecution. Laban campaign manager Lorenzo Tanyada led a death of democracy march from Quezon City to the Manila Cathedral, April 9, 1978. The march expected to pull in thousands of supporters along the way. This time, nobody dared to join the marchers who numbered about 500. Fear gripped Manila anew. When Tanyada and the marchers were arrested along España and shunted into buses, hardly anybody bothered to look their way. The man in the palace had won his bet. Whoever said the Philippines was a nation of cowards must have been right. So Ninoy was forgotten again, but not before he demonstrated that Filipinos could be roused, that their hearts could be touched, if only for an instant. There was something else about Ninoy. Somewhere in his psyche, he had a soft spot for Ferdinand Marcos. Ninoy believed that whatever Marcos had done to him and to his family, Marcos still had a sense of history, that Marcos cared for whatever history and posterity would say about him, that Marcos could be talked to, that presumably Marcos could link hands with him and together they could restore democracy. This struggle can only mean victory for all of us. It will mean victory because we are different from those that we oppose. Those that we oppose are happy with the material wealth. But for how long? I have written Mr. Marcos letters upon letters and I told him, read your history, my friend. 
I have no hatred for you. I only have pity because if you do not see and you do not remove the calluses from your eyes, if you do not remove your blinders, you will meet the same fate of all the dictators of history. What happened to Mao Tse Tung? His wife is now in jail. What happened to Piron? Isabelita is now in jail. What happened to Franco? He's now forgotten. What happened to the Shah? For all of the things that he did, the monuments to his greatness have already been torn down. There has never been a single dictator in history that has lived forever. And so I tell Mr. Marcos, Mr. Marcos, study the lessons of history before it is too late. And so, when the dictator allowed Ninoy out on a furlough, October 11, 1979, for his and Corey's 25th wedding anniversary, Ninoy developed his rendezvous with history formula. As visitors once again streamed to his Quezon City residence, Ninoy openly advocated the formation of the Council of Elders. The council would overhang the Marcos government as a supreme advisory body. A coalition government, including the opposition, would follow. National elections would be held. So Ninoy waited for Marcos's call. They were to rendezvous at a neutral site, two political giants joining hands. The historic rendezvous never materialized. It was an impossible dream. Ninoy returned to Fort Bonifacio. An important man came to call, General Fabian Ver. Ver told Ninoy he was wrong about the president having lupus. Ver said the president was as strong as ever. Ver gently told Ninoy that Marcos was not buying his historic rendezvous idea. And so the cobwebs of oblivion gathered anew around Ninoy's Fort Bonifacio cell. There were talks even negotiations about a possible exile to the U.S. But they petered out. Some close advisors of Marcos feared that Ninoy in America would be a political bullet on the loose, a mischief maker who would use the CIA to stage a Bay of Pigs assault on the Philippines. That was the tragedy of the Marcos philosophy. The man in the palace could never believe that Ninoy had changed, that Ninoy really wanted to help him. The tragedy of Ninoy's spiritual philosophy was his insistence that Christ existed in every man, that given a chance he, Ninoy, could bring out the son of Nazarene in Ferdinand Marcos. Mr. Marcos is a human being and Mr. Marcos has a conscience. I may even concede that in his own fashion he thinks he's doing right. It is therefore our duty and our obligation to enlighten him. It is our duty and our obligation to tell Mr. Marcos that maybe he is wrong. But definitely, Mr. Marcos is a human being and I have not lost hope that we can still reach him in the recesses of his conscience. The truth was that for Marcos, power was the ultimate fix, power at the very top. Secretly, he may have admired Ninoy, for Marcos respected men of courage, of vision, of tenacity. Napoleon was an idol of Marcos, and Marcos reveled in Napoleon's famous quote, A great man comes from the encounter between a great mind and a great opportunity. So the days and the weeks fell like autumn leaves for the man in prison. If he was to languish forever in jail, so be it. But fate again had a calendar that neither Marcos nor Ninoy anticipated. On March 19, 1980, while jogging outside his cell, Ninoy had a heart attack. Well, they allowed me to run, and they made a little corral for me. They brought me out between 11 and 12 o'clock. Every day, they brought me out to exercise. On that particular day of March, as I was walking around my little corral, all of a sudden I developed a chest pain. And then the pain was so terrible that I sat down and I asked my guard to massage my chest and asked him to bring me back. I called for the army doctors, they checked me and they said, 
Muscle spasm lang po yan. That's nothing. Just take a rest. And so I rested. But after 40 days, I was so weak, I could not even take a bath. I was shaking. And I told my doctor, I said, look, doctor, I don't know, I said, your diagnosis or its accuracy, but I am very, very weak. Please bring me to the Philippine Heart Center and get me an examination. That doctor, fortunately, on that morning, after 40 days, on April 10, 28, his name is Colonel Bayani Garcia, came to my office and said, yes, Senator, sabi niya, I will now recommend that they bring you to the Heart Center because apparently you're not getting well. Mr. Marcos has just arrived from Honolulu. I will make my recommendation. And I wrote a letter and I told them, if you do not bring me to the Heart Center, I will be constrained to appeal to the Supreme Court. And so he said, no, sir. Ako na pong bahala, I will talk to the commanding general. At one o'clock that day, a knock on my door came and I was given a letter from the commanding general. I thought it was the approval of my request. When I opened the letter, it was handwritten note and it said, My dear Senator Aquino, it is with deep regret that I inform you, your doctor, Colonel Bayani S. Garcia, died of a massive heart attack an hour ago. <laughs> if you were in my place, here is your doctor telling you it's a muscle spasm, tapos bigla siyang namatay. How would you feel? <laughs> Finally, on May 5, 1980, almost midnight, they took me from my cell and they brought me to the heart center. That was a Monday. The doctors at the heart center met me, took preliminary tests, and they told me, Senator, they said, tomorrow we will begin the battery of tests. And so I slept, but I could not sleep. That was the first time I was brought out of my cell in almost seven years and seven months. And there were beautiful nurses, and the first time I was seeing women in seven years and seven months. And naturally, I was watching my heart as it was palpitating. <laughs> but as I sat down after that x-ray, I was just about to sip my coffee. All of a sudden, I, get, I got hit again by a terrible chest pain that was almost choking me and my arm was getting paralyzed. So I told the nurse, I said, Miss, please bring me to bed. So they brought me to bed and they put all of those gadgets. And all of a sudden, the needles were squiggling. And they called the doctor. The doctor looked at the tracings. And then after one hour, they came back to me and said, Mr. Senator, we are canceling all, all tests. I said, why? Because we already know what's wrong with you. I said, what's wrong with me? You have black art arteries and you must undergo an emergency triple bypass. Otherwise, you may die in six days to six months. I told them, where can I have my operation? Dito lang po, sa heart center. And that's the heart center of Imelda Marcos. <laughs> and I asked, who can do the operation for me? The director said, ako lang po. There are two other assistants if you want, but I'm the only one performing in the center. He was director, he was the director of the heart center, handpicked also by Imelda. I said, doctor, pagpaliban muna ka ako. Thank you na lang. I said, if they cannot operate on me in America, please bring me to my cell. The truth is, I did not want them to touch me in Manila. And so there was a crisis. The Sec Deputy Minister of Defense came to my room. He tried to talk me out of my decision. I said, no. And so finally he said, are you willing to write a letter to Marcos requesting to be brought to America? I said, yes. Eh, siguri kang ganun, mas maganda kung mag-iwan ka ng dalawang anak mo, parang maniwala na babalik ka. <laughs> and so I wrote my letter to Mr. Marcos and made two covenants. That if I leave, I shall return. And two, that while in America, I shall not speak out against his regime. And I also said, I will only bring three of my children with me. That's also true. But of course, the other two were already abroad. <laughs> and then my friends, that was a Wednesday, when I wrote that letter, all of a sudden on Thursday morning, May 8, my wife visited me early in the morning and she told me, 
The hospital is crawling with metrocom cars. Guards all over the place. Bakay kami magbibisita sa yo. Then all of a sudden, my guards started jumping, putting their barong tagalog, hiding all of their guns. I said, "Tama, may darating na VIP." And then, lo and behold, the beautiful one ascended into my suite. She came, and she was really beautiful. She has not aged, and she sat down and said, "Nakuni noy sabi niya, I'm sorry to see you like that." Hindi ko lang nasabi sa kanya, eh kayo may kagagawan nito eh. <laughs> At any rate, I had my bathrobe and I was like this and she talked to me and we talked to her and she was very nice about it. And then all of a sudden, after one hour, she said, Would you like to go to America? Abay ka ko, sure, sure. <laughs> oh, oh. Eh sa tuwa ko, tinanggal ko pa yung aking kwintas, kako anting-anting ko ito, iwan ako nakakupere dito. Palayasin na niyo ako, pumunta niyo ako sa Amerika. Sabi niya, there's a plane leaving at 6 o'clock. You can be in that plane. After a three and a half hour triple heart bypass, Ninoy was a new man. Dr. Rolando Solis, one of the heart specialists in attendance at Baylor, would later marvel at Ninoy's heart. During a bypass, it is necessary to pour ice water on the heart to stop it from beating while the heart was being attached to a heart lung machine. Despite the first deluge of ice water, Ninoy's heart continued to beat. Another deluge was necessary before it would stop. I have been asked by many people, what is the actual situation in the Philippines? I think this Japanese explained the situation in the Philippines very well. As you very well know, the Japanese have a difficulty pronouncing their R's. Manila becomes Manira. And so this Japanese gentleman stood up and said, My dear Filipino people, you are very rocky. And I consider, he said, the Filipino people the most rocky people in Asia. <laughs> and the people were, of course, surprised. and They wanted to know why, were, why they were lucky. He said, you know why you are rocky? You have a president who robs you. And you have a first lady who robs you more. The three years in Boston were the best three years the Aquinos ever experienced as a family. Ninoy did his level best to make up for the seven years and seven months that he was in Fort Bonifacio. While it's true, Mr. Marcos, I said, that after my eight years in prison, I have lost appetite for office. I am no longer seeking the presidency of this land. I'm not seeking anymore any office in this country. But believe me, I said when I tell you that while I have vowed never to enter the political arena again, I shall dedicate the last drop of my blood to the restoration of freedom and the dismantlement of your martial law. Kids queued for two hours so he could escort Chris to a movie. Two years as a fellow in Harvard University Center for International Affairs and one year as a fellow in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology did more wonders for Nino's already prodigious mind. In Fort Bonifacio, Nino must have read anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 books and other reading materials. This was the most encyclopedic political mind the Philippines had ever known. At Harvard, Ninoy refined his philosophy of non-violence, of Christ being present in other men. Among others, he read Jean Stark, Dietrich von Hofer, Reinhold Niebuhr, Thoreau, Tolstoy, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. All of these authors exalted non-violence. Like Ninoy, a number of them had been in prison where they were divested of all earthly pleasures and passions. But once out of prison, they did not seek revenge against their tormentors. The frail and ascetic Gandhi pushed serenely forward even as nightsticks, rifle butts, and machine gun bullets felled his followers. Nonviolence was to consume Ninoy even more passionately. 
I've always said that Mr. Marcos is the original terrorist. He is right now employing state violence. But if we use violence against him, he will only justify the use of more violence against us. And since he's, more, he's a more violent man, he has more forces of repression, we will be the loser. In other words, as Gandhi said, if he uses violence against you, do not give him a reason to justify his violence. Because if you're not violent, then before the bar of public opinion and before God, he's the only sinner. Gradually, he began to feel in his bones that one day, he would return to the Philippines and resume his duel with Marcos on ground level. Wherever he went in Boston and in the U.S., Ninoy was a big hit and a charmer. Very simply, Christian socialism means to me an equal opportunity for advancement and the full development of the human being. This means that the poorest person in the land must be given the equal opportunity for education. Number two, the Christian socialist believes that the great legitimizer of government is the ballot, not the bullet. And therefore, because we believe in the ballot, we believe in a majority rule. So that if the majority should opt and should win in a contest, then the minority should accept the majority mandate. But we put a culatilia, that the majority, even if it wins, must respect minority rights. Number three, we do not believe in the exploitation of man by man. Meaning, we do not believe in unbridled capitalism where the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. In a developed country in America, you may have capitalism. But in a country like the Philippines with very meager resources and a developing economy, we must harness our meager economy and maximize their benefit. And therefore, there should be centralized economic planning and the government must actually give the direction as to prevent any overlap. Finally, I do not believe in the monopoly of basic industries. Why should one family monopolize one electric company in the Philippines? Or why should one family monopolize the ownership of one airline company in the Philippines? Or why should one company monopolize the telephone company in the Philippines? Since the government is funding all of this to begin with, these families are borrowing from government institutions and must depend on government guarantees. Then I say, let the government own them and let the people share in the profit. Christian socialism, therefore, is nothing more than democracy. Dr. Ben Brown, head of Harvard's fellowship studies, was amazed at the scope of Ninoy's mind. So were doctors Stanley Hoffman, Lucien Pye, David Steinberg, many of whose writings Ninoy had already read in Fort Bonifacio. The Philippine bases in the Philippines, in the Philippines, be maintained, however, that rentals must be collected along the Spanish model. But let me divide the question. Firstly, I believe that when it comes to foreign policy, both the majority and the opposition should not wash their dirty linen in public. And therefore, I suggest a bipartisan approach to foreign policy. In other words, we should not be talking outside where our negotiating opponent will be using both ends against the middle. I think that is against Filipino interests so that we should have a working agreement among ourselves before we go out. I am therefore in agreement with the Philippine government's position that we should assert our sovereignty on this basis, that we should collect rentals. Now, why do I say this? It is true that the United States government has been giving us military aid for the last 30 years under the Mutual Defense Assistance Pact. But it's also true that the Philippine army has been the most neglected armies in Asia by the United States for the simple reason that we are not a frontline army. And so I said, rather than continue a situation of this nature, may we therefore ask the United States government that they pay us rentals for this basis so that with these rentals we can now update the position of our armed forces, we can have our own missile batteries, we can have our own missile frigates, we can have our own modern weaponry, rather than go out with our hands out so that this would be a quid pro quo basis. Dr. Brown would relate after Ninoy's death that no conversation, no subject, or important event ever escaped Ninoy's multifaceted mind. Even as we would discuss American history, Dr. Brown said, Ninoy would chime in with his incisive grasp of the subject. Corey would also recount that at one time Ninoy and she were invited to dinner by a group of American businessmen. They were just so amazed, said Corey, that Ninoy knew more about American history than they. 
Ninoy also related to journalists in Boston how Marcos envied him his erudition. I envy you, Ninoy quoted Marcos as saying, because you have all the time in the world. At your fingertips, you have the greatest symphonies available to you, the greatest books, which are not available to me because all my working hours are spent with people. Here you are with the greatest luxury of the greatest minds in the world. And so I told Mr. Marcos, negotiate now when you are still in a position to dictate terms. In other words, it is always good to negotiate when you are still strong. Do not wait when you're ready to wait, because by then, they'll be asking for your blood. And because it's brilliant, I anchored my thesis on that point. But then, most probably, I'm going against the tide of history, because no dictator has ever yielded power voluntarily. And so, I put the kicker. Mr. Marcos, be unique. Be the first tyrant. <laughs> and set the record to you. Three meetings with Imelda Marcos in New York failed to alter Ninoy's course. Imelda offered him prestige, money, if only he would recant. Even some State Department officials at the time felt that Ninoy's return to Manila would just rock the boat of U.S.-Philippine relations. Marcos was their ally, and Ninoy was an interloper. Ninoy told the Agence France Press in an interview I don't think the Americans trust me. They're not sure about me, what I would do, what would be my actuation if ever I should become president. And so they cannot be sure I am their boy. The United States has given Mr. Marcos four times more military aid since martial law. Today, it is giving Mr. Marcos six times more aid. And if you look at the record, Mr. Marcos was able to borrow almost eight billion. And most of this came from American-assisted organizations like the World Bank and the IMF. And therefore, you cannot blame my countrymen when they feel that the Americans have tilted in favor of Mr. Marcos. Our plea is very simple. We are all your friends. America is not our enemy. But please do not help our dictator because it will make our job harder. All we want you to do is stay out if you cannot help those who are oppressed in as much as or in spite of the fact that you claim you're the home of the free or the land of the free and the home of the brave, if you cannot even help us, then at least do not hurt us. Finally, it became clear that Ninoy was coming home. The earlier muffled roll of distant drums that he was returning now hit Malacanang like a thunderclap. Ninoy had to be stopped at all costs. The orders were out. All international airlines were warned against airlifting Ninoy to Manila or else. Imelda warned against possible assassination. So did Defense Minister Juan Ponce Enrile. In an urgent cable, he counseled Ninoy to come home only when the danger had passed. Corey and the children bowed to Ninoy's decision, but the other members of the huge Aquino clan, particularly his mother, Doña Aurora, were aghast and against. By this time, the spiritual strength of Ninoy had reached the mountaintop. The spectral voices of danger, assassination and perdition bounced off the man who surveyed the valley below. This time, he and Marcos would go to the edge of the cliff, and there, the future of the Philippines would be decided. for Ninoy's return were simplicity itself. After 20 years of Marcos, the Philippines had dug itself into a huge foreign debt. The economy was in rags. Ninoy said that whoever would succeed Marcos needed 10 years to enable the Philippines to recover from the economic holocaust. I am going back to the Philippines, and if I have to go back to jail, so be it. 
But even more forbidding was the communist insurgency. Ninoy dreaded the day that the flags of Marxism, Leninism, the hammer and the sickle would ever fly over the country. Wherever the communists were in power, he said, the traffic of refugees was always from east to west. Ninoy saw the NPA just down the road, ready to blow up the Philippines and bring in civil war. While there was still time, the communists had to be stopped. Ninoy also surmised that the health of Marcos was about to take a tailspin, that before long he would no longer be his own man, that the generals would take over and bump off Imelda. So Ninoy had to return to be in on the ground floor, to help defuse the political time bomb, to peddle hope, for hope had gone, and the smell of drift and decay was everywhere. Ninoy also had to return for that one hour one-on-one -on -one with Marcos. For that one hour, he said, I am laying my life on the line. To many who argued that Filipinos were not worth saving because precious few had the courage to fight the dictatorship, Ninoy replied, I have weighed carefully the virtues and faults of the Filipino, and I have come to the conclusion that he is worth dying for because he is the nation's greatest untapped resource. To his younger sisters, Lupita and Desi, who told him, even their close friends suffered instant diarrhea at the mere mention of Ninoy's name, he replied, Even if only ten Filipinos would rise and join me, my return would be worth it. But there was another element to Ninoy's decision to return. He correctly diagnosed that in any inventory of traits Filipinos admire most, courage would go up the flagpole more than any other. He was right. In a pre-return interview three weeks before he died, Ninoy said, Filipinos respect and admire courage best of all. Well, I'm going home. I'm going back home to prove to Marcos that I am not afraid of him. And I want to prove to our countrymen that I am going to stand my ground even at the risk of my life. And so Ninoy realized his moment of truth had come. Since he was denied his passport by Imelda, he used another one with a striking appellation, Martial Bonifacio. It was a play of names to denote martial law and Fort Bonifacio. Ninoy's return was a countdown that the Philippine government easily spotted and plotted with our two-hour precision. I suppose there's a physical danger because, uh, you know, assassination is part of public service. Look at poor President Reagan. He got shot because Hinckley fell in love with Jody Foster. So uh, that's uh, part of the hazard of the game. It's possible Ninoy knew that Marcos knew his every movement since he left Boston August 13, 1983. My feeling is we all have to die sometime. Uh, if it's my fate to die by an assassin's bullet, so be it. But I cannot be petrified by inaction or fear of assassination and therefore stay in a corner. But flood died had come. And Julius Caesar it was who said, decisions were made at flood died before the waters recede. I think the, the very fact alone that we can land is victory enough. Hesitate and all is lost. I have promised to return. I have returned against all odds. August sunlight was streaming down Manila when Ninoy's China Airlines plane landed at the MIA before noon. You have to be very ready with your hand camera because yeah. this action can become very fast. Yeah. In a matter of uh, three, four minutes, it could be all over, you know. And <laughs> I may not be able to talk to you again after this. As he descended with burly military escorts, 25 shots rang out. Only one of them. The first, it seemed, killed Ninoy. The killing was awesome. It was also obscene. It did not square with the culture of the Filipino. It was like a hand crawling out of a slimy rock. 
It had an animal scream to it, a primal scream of somebody gone completely mad. It was unchristian. And because it was unchristian, it roused the Christian nation first to shock, then to shame, then to quiet indignation, then to street outrage. The killing opened a huge wound across the nation's conscience. A fitful Marcos disowned the assassination. Predictably, he said the communists did it. The killing might have been, might have received the blessings of the NPA or the communist hierarchy because they would shoot two birds with one stone. Uh, they would eliminate Aquino, who was responsible for some of the liquidation or killings, according to them. Ironically, Ninoy got more than he bargained for. Not just the Philippines, but the whole world sat bolt upright and took notice of his unbelievable heroism. What happened on that airport tarmac that high noon fitted perfectly into a favorite quotation of Ninoy from a Chinese sage. There is a sublime thieving in all giving. A man gives us all and we are his forever.